Okay. So multi-service without a mesh. Um, so I'm sure that some of you are here because you really don't like service meshes. This talk is not actually going to tear down service meshes, but um, hopefully we'll get a little deeper understanding why people are using service meshes and how you can solve it without a service mesh, and then you can decide, do I need a service mesh? Is that the right tool for this job? Or you know, can I take two or three components and get the pieces that I want? Um, it's also a little bit of a call to make things better. Um, one of the things I've been describing to people as my journey of um, building this talk is discovering that we're really bad at software. And so I'm going to be calling out a couple places where we really should be doing better. Um, so, you know, hey, look, I've, I've built, uh, you know, um, multiple microservices wired together. Um, this is awesome. You know, it's a nice, simple architecture diagram. I've got a front-end service. I've got a couple back-end services. They each have their databases. They're nicely factored. They talk to each other through APIs. And I'm not ready for a service mesh yet. Can I just slap some Kubernetes on it, make it work? Well, yeah. Look, you know, we've got a DB operator. Everything else is just out-of-the-box Kubernetes. It's awesome. Um, we're done. OK, great. Go home. Oh, wait, we're at a security talk. So um, this is the part where I start to make you sad. Um, and we will keep getting sadder over the course of the talk. And at the end, um, we will go to another talk and repeat the process. I don't know why you all are here. Um, so start with, it's not too bad. Our users are connecting to us over the internet. We've got an ingress. Um, encryption, I hear that's an important thing. I remember Zach talking about that in the little, you know, TLS encrypted and removed, the NSA is listening on all your wires and all that stuff. Um, but it's okay. We've got Cert Manager. We've got Let's Encrypt. We can just go and connect things. Assuming that I'm using Ingress or Gateway API, if I'm using Kong's APIs or Traffic's APIs or Contour's APIs or Istio's APIs, then I need to do some manual wiring together. It's not great, but do we really expect Cert Manager to expect to support 15 different ingresses? No. Gateway API, maybe we'll give you those capabilities later in the year? I don't know. Um, so it's OK. Not too bad. Great. So we've encrypted the traffic over the internet. Now we're secure. We're safe. All the bad guys can connect to us through TLS, and nobody on the internet can sniff the bad traffic they send us. Oh. well. We maybe need something like an API gateway to enforce stuff like rate limits, um, maybe API keys and things like that in some form of authentication. Um, so we don't just want an ingress. We want something that has these capabilities. And some of the ingresses that you can get out there do have these capabilities, um, some of them up to a certain point. And sometimes you need to go beyond that, and you actually want an API gateway and not just an ingress or a service mesh. Um, great. And now we just send all our traffic over the cluster. And you know our CNI lets us do layer four policies, maybe. There's no feedback on your network policy as to whether or not it's being enforced. You just say, I want this policy. And maybe you're prevented from sending other traffic, and maybe you aren't. Um, but that's OK. Some CNIs also support encryption. How do you tell if that's happening? Well, you sneak onto the cluster so you're not in a pod, and you do a packet capture, and you see whether or not the traffic's encrypted. Um, yeah, there's no interface in asking Kubernetes, is my CNI encrypting traffic? Is my CNI enforcing network policy? No. Nope. You just build your application for Kubernetes, and sometimes it's secured, and sometimes it's not. And you, know, you really just ought to know your Kubernetes provider well enough to know the answers. And every developer should know which Kubernetes they're deploying to. Um, and every Helm chart author should know which Kubernetes they're deploying to. Yeah. Um, we may also want to actually be able to restrict access. So in this case, oops, went too far. We want to be able, the front end should be able to do orders and addresses to the back ends. But maybe orders needs to be able to read addresses. But the order server should never be updating someone's address. That's like, that's not right. So we actually need to establish identities for these things. And you've heard a lot about zero trust. And I'm not going to tell you if these need to be zero trust or not, but we need some form of identity that the applications can actually reason about. 
service accounts. Awesome. You can take a service account token. It's mounted in your pod. You can send it to someone else, and they can verify that you are who you say you are by going to the API server and asking, hey, is this a valid service account token? They can also go to the API server and do anything you could do. Do not send those tokens to other people. They let them, they, they let, that lets the other person impersonate you. Um, fortunately, uh, I was gonna say this is a year, year and a half or so ago, um, the, token account, the service account projection API showed up, which lets you say, hey, I want an OAuth token for my service account identity, and I want it to have a different audience. I don't want it to be believed by the API server. I want it to have this other audience string. And then your destination says, oh, I'm looking for audience named you know, orders. And so you get yourself a service account that says orders, and you send it over, and that's great. Um, we kind of sort of solved this with some open ID and so forth. Um, and now we're sending these over the wire, and maybe our CNI is encrypted, and maybe they aren't, and anyone who grabs them or sees them along the way can reuse them. So um, why don't we just not worry so much about whether or not the CNI is encrypted and set up a cluster local CA? Um, that's been a standard enterprise solution for, I don't know, 20 years or so. You know, you get a, a self-signed cert, and you use it to sign your certs within your um, DNS names that aren't public to the internet. And remember, all these names are service.cluster.local. If you want to go Let's Encrypt and get a cert for service.cluster.local and they give it to you, that's going to be real exciting. You get to publish a blog post about a vulnerability you found in Let's Encrypt, and it shows up in the certificate transparency log so everyone can see it happened. Um, it's not going to happen. So you need a self-signed cert, which is great. Um, your other option is that you could use Spiffy. And you could roll out Spiffy um, and teach all your systems to use Spiffy and interact and, and manage that and so forth. Um, it looks like you can pick your language, any language you want, as long as it's Go, Java, or Rust. So if you were using TypeScript, um, now you get to learn Rust and how to interact with it. Or maybe Go or, Ruby or Java, but I'm guessing Rust is going to be the best of the three. In any case, might not be what you were thinking of when you were like, oh, I'll write a, a TypeScript front end so that I can write TypeScript and then I can write TypeScript in the browser. <sighs> and in any case, we've now said, oh, identity problems are hard. I know, we'll simplify to a key distribution problem. We'll say, oh, now we just need to get this CA cert to all the different places. Um, and mounting the certificate and, okay, I'll serve the certificate is not too bad. Getting a CA cert into an arbitrary Docker container is not great. Um, Golang is not too bad. You say like SSL cert -er, all my certs are here, and it will just pick things up and load them. Open SSL, it's not too bad. You said SSL cert -er. Then you need to take all the certs and you need to hash their names to the special hashing format that OpenSSL wants. And so you get a directory full of names that are seven characters dot zero and a sim link to your cert. Uh, yeah, you could do this someplace else. You can do it in an init container. This needs to happen before your binary starts. So you can't just take a container using OpenSSL and magic a cert into it without a bunch of extra work. Um, and in Java, there's a different tool that you need to load things in that's Java specific. Um, there may be other TLS libraries that have different ways of doing this. I couldn't find any well, widely used ones. But here is my private CA. Please trust it. Has been a problem for 20 years and we apparently still don't have a standard interface. If you pick a service mesh, the service mesh controls all this, and so you have one implementation, and it's whatever your service mesh is implemented in. But now you can see why you might want to do this. Cloud native um, build packs and service bindings have some stuff that you can stick in, but again, you're starting to build a big layer to replace um, that service mesh. So, okay. Maybe service mesh is a good choice. Um, but it can be hard to roll out a service mesh 
and have part on and part off and figure out how to ramp all this stuff up. It's getting easier, um, especially if everything is in Kubernetes, but um, it's still hard. Sidecar injection has a lot of problems. I know Istio ambient, ambient mode is the new fix for that. It looks a lot like a CNI, to be honest. Um, we run one agent per node and it you know, potentially encrypts things and it doesn't tell you if it did it or not. Um, fortunately, the feedback may be slightly better, but it's still potentially a lot. And the resource requirements can be high. I've heard people complaining about how much CPU they're spending on Envoy proxies instead of on like their application stuff. Um, it's got a lot of functionality, which is great if you need that functionality. And if you don't, there's a whole bunch of complicated things that you need to figure out, do I need this or not? Is it, is it important? And you know, some organizations are gonna take one step at a time. They're gonna, they're gonna figure out how to get on Kubernetes and then they're gonna figure out, you know, do I need a service mesh and if so, what does that look like? Um, some organizations are happy to jump in with both feet to all new technologies. Um, sometimes those migrations work out great and sometimes um, you're three years down the road and you're like, nothing, still nothing works on my new platform. Can I go back to the old one now? So there's something to be said for adopting one thing at a time. Another reason might be multi-tenancy. So let's say I want a shared Redis service and I want to have you know, okay, this namespace asks for 100 megs of Redis cache, this namespace asks for 500, and then I'm gonna have one pool of workers behind it that service these things. And so I'm gonna have a router that comes in and you want that router to present a service in each one of those namespaces. And Service Mesh really wants to know what your underlying topology of pods are. And you're like, no, no, this is, this is an independent Redis here and an independent Redis here and an independent Redis here is the presentation you want to make to your developers. And the services mesh is like, no, they all have the same identity. Um, it's all the same thing underneath. And um, for both of these cases, you can tunnel things through with TLS SNI, but if you're running one of these multi-tenant services, it breaks stuff like network policy because network policy says it's all going to one port. It's all one L4 path. Um, token projection. Um, if you're a client, if you're a multi-tenant client, if you go out and call different things, um, token projection wants to protect one service account that's the service account your pod runs as. And there's no way to say, I'm authorized to use this other account. Please give me a token for something else. Um, Spiffy, again, it really wants to attest you are this pod, not you're working on behalf of this service. Um, so you can roll your own TLS SNI for this. Um, let's talk a little bit about how we can undo some of the damage that we did by wanting to go back and share resources across the cluster for efficiency's sake. You know, um, full disclosure here, I work on the Knative project. Knative effectively does this for your pods because sometimes we scale you down to zero, sometimes we scale you up real big. We have a central shared piece because if there's something, if you had to run something in each, in, you know, for each deployment where you said, hey, you don't have to run your pod, but you have to run this other thing and sometimes you run your pod too, everyone would be like, that doesn't save resources. But if we have one central component and you have 10 namespaces which you know, scale up and down to zero, that central component can give you big savings. Um, so network policy, I was just saying, these are all the same TCP port. Well, unless you allocate a whole bunch of different ports, one for each service on your, um, you know, on your uh, router instance. And then you can see here, um, you know, this looks like, you know, this name Redis Foo is on this port. And then um, if I create, a, you know, a bar instance, I'll name it for bar and it'll be cluster IP and the target port will be maybe one higher or something like that. And then um, when the traffic comes in from the CNI, I can say, oh, it came in on port, um, you know, 16844. Um, that must be for this service. And it came in on this other port. It must be for this other service. And so I can use, go back to using layer four policies again. Um, and I, you know, I can use TLS SNI in combination with this or not, 
but it's nice to have defense in depth like options. And when you route everything to a single endpoint inside the cluster, um, you can't use the destination IP address because SNI has stomped that. And you can't use the sender because you don't know who that sender was. It could be, you know, you, you might be able to figure out which node it is, but a pod can appear and disappear at any time. So you don't really want to say, oh, I looked and at this moment it was this. Maybe you're looking at an old stale cache or something like that. Um, so destination port can let you recover this. Um, so token projection doesn't work. But if it's important for you to be calling out, I don't have a great example of this yet, um, but I've been thinking about it because I, I fear that I will in the future. You could actually be your own open ID provider and say, hey, I'm going to you know, be this client or that client or something like that. Um, there might be a Kubernetes API to do, I can act as this something else. I know that AWS has that, but I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any KEPs suggesting that impersonate another service account is on the Kubernetes to-do list. So this was the best um, I could come up with for token projection. And sometimes you might need some of these and a mesh. Um, if you wind your head way back to the beginning, we talked about why you might want an API gateway and you might want to do rate limiting on a per API key basis. And that might be something where you'd rather keep that on a central API gateway, even if you're using a service mesh. So you might have traffic comes in, service mesh to API gateway, to service mesh to your application backend. Um, and that might be your right choice. And now if any of you were, were thinking about, oh wait, isn't that a lot of Envoy CPU? Yeah, we talked about that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I'm going to call back as well to Zach's five points in the keynote yesterday. Um, pretty much every service that has user data and some sort of authorization model is in a way multi-tenant. Um, you know, if you think about it, like something like Facebook or, um, you know, your shopping cart on you know, Amazon, like that is a service and my shopping cart isn't your shopping cart, isn't your shopping cart. So that's really a multi-tenant service. It's not an API controlling, you know, compute things, but you still need a lot of that same authorization logic. Um, and so you actually will need to get your application involved in the security, even if you have a service mesh. Um, you may be able to make some coarse-grained rules that X can't talk to Y at a little bit more of an intermediate level than network policy is. So rather than saying, you know, in this diagram, orders can talk to, you know, orders can't talk to addresses or orders can talk to addresses, you can say orders can only talk to addresses with its own identity. It can't go and impersonate a customer or something like that. And so maybe orders has a special lookup in addresses to, to go and get things out. And that's how you decide to structure things. Um, but addresses wants to know who's calling it and what permissions should they have. And are they allowed to access this or that type of data? And it might be even down to a field level. You know, I let, um, I let orders view some of the address data, but not historical data. Whereas the user can see like, oh, these are the past addresses I had. And yeah, you could do a lot of that logic in mesh. Whoops, I don't know why that happened. Um, you could do a lot of that logic in the mesh, but imagine writing Istio policies like this for every single user. <laughs> your mesh would die, you would hate your life, um, and it would be much easier to build this into your application. So maybe your mesh can, can answer some of those lower level questions about who's talking to me, but you need some higher level questions about what's the application supposed to do that you actually don't want to pull out into your service mesh. Um, I talked about API gateways earlier. This is more of the same. There's a lot of stuff that you can get out of an API gateway. Some of that stuff is, you know, maybe if you built your application today, you would need it. Maybe in some cases, it's the right thing even today because 
you know, if you're using something like Apigee, you can, you know, call out to an external system to say, hey, you know, does this customer have this property or something like that? And building that into your application might be less disgusting than building it into your API gateway. Um, but you probably don't want every single node on your mesh loading these policies. Because um, some of these policies are complicated and crazy. And yes, you could push that WASM everywhere, but why do you want to do that? And so the last, the last piece here is what I've been alluding to earlier. Um, there's two different levels. At the network policy or the mesh level, you know, hey, these, you know, is this allowed to come in and, you know, who, you know, what server on the network sent it to me? And there's a second level of what user made the request. And so you actually need to build both of these layers and then you can start to make more complicated decisions as well, like, hey, you know, is a user coming in from the orders system able to go and, you know, update their, you know, call an API to update their address? And you're like, well, no, it doesn't make sense for that to come from the order system. That should only come from the front end. And maybe in the future, it's like it could come from the front end or it could come through customer support. And so maybe the customer support portal becomes another, you know, top level network policy source that you can consider and you're like, oh, if it comes through customer support, then I need to write this audit log over here. And if it comes from the front end, then I don't need to write the same audit log because um, presumably user was logged in as opposed to someone called and convinced customer support they were the user. And um, that's a social engineering attack. And we are never going to get computers to be able to protect us against that because it's about humans talking to humans. Um, and so a service mesh will never solve that because it's technology. <laughs> and I love that we are building more of this technology and that we can close down the space of attacks that computers can do, but we need to think about the attacks that people do too. Um, so yeah, in summary, everything is pretty awesome. We've got a whole bunch of really cool technologies. We kind of trip over the basics. Um, so we've got these awesome service meshes, but we can't get a CA cert into a random container because that would require talking to Java people and to Go people and to C++ people and to Python people. Um, and getting all these libraries to agree on a place, even if it's not the place they used to do it. Um, authentication and identity is hard. Um, should you use Spiffy? Should you use cluster API token projection? Should you use your cloud provider's managed identity service? I can't answer those things for you, um, but there's trade-offs. None of them is great or perfect. Um, but we've been working on it for 40 years, so I'm sure the answer's just around the corner. <laughs> authorization is hard. Um, figuring out the right place to make an authorization decision is hard, and um, we can build tools to help you authorize things, but you need to figure out which are the right tools and the right places for it, and sometimes the answer is gonna be, you write your own code, you write your own policy engine, and um, yeah, Maybe ChatGPT will, you know, build me a policy engine that can make the right business decisions someday. But so far, I think our job security is actually pretty good. <laughs> um, and yeah, meshes, meshes will solve some of these things as long as you're willing to, to put a lot of trust in the mesh. Um, that makes me, as someone who believes in defense in depth, a little bit nervous if it says, and all your trust is in X. Um, there was a talk yesterday that was talking about, okay, so you get, you know, you get encrypted communication between the mesh, but then the mesh to your application is clear text. And that's over localhost, so you can only snoop it if you get like root on localhost, which, you know, at which point I can also just rip it out of your application's memory. Like, you know, dev mem is a thing. Um, but it also means that my application doesn't understand whether the other end is encrypted or not. And so 
I go make a connection and I think, oh, this is great, and then I end up on a cluster where there isn't a service mesh and there's no feedback that says, hey, wait, you tried to make this connection and you wanted it to be encrypted and it's not. I have no way of hinting that to my environment. So service meshes make me a little nervous in that sense because it's hard to see that you're getting the thing you want. Um, and again, working around all of these may add some new challenges in terms of getting all your identities out there and all your certs out there and stuff like that. And so I bet we'll be here again in, you know, well, maybe not in Seattle, but I bet we'll be having more cloud native security cons dealing with all of these problems for another five or 10 years at least. Um, and then maybe all will do something else other than security and new people will be here. Maybe they'll figure out the problems. Maybe we will. I actually have confidence that we can make these things better, but um, we're going to have to focus on not just the fancy new shiny stuff, but um, nailing the basics. So thank you, and sorry for the um, mess on starting on time. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions and stuff if people if people have anything. <laughs> Or any corrections, you know, it may be that there are good answers to some of this stuff that I've just missed. I was talking to someone over at Keyless, I think, earlier, and they're like, we have a great library for that stuff. And I'm like, great, we have another library for SSL. <laughs> like, it's good to have some diversity there. You don't want, um, back when Heartbleed happened, I remember it affected basically everyone because there was one SSL library and everyone used OpenSSL. And so if there was a bug, uh, it hit everybody. Um, and so the fact that there's boring SSL now and a couple other implementations I think is good. But um, if their interfaces aren't standardized on either the file system or the application, it's really hard to move between them. And I know I don't have the right people in the room for that, but <laughs> uh, part of what makes it hard. I need to find the right people. Yes? So, okay, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat the question so it picks up on the recording. Um, the question was, uh, do I think that um, improving service mesh or finding a new replacement concept is a better way to solve this? And um, I guess I'm, uh, I try not to define my solutions ahead of time and instead define my requirements and see if a solution is going to match. And so I guess I would call out some of these challenges and see whether they are fundamental to the definition of a service mesh. Things like, I can't tell if the service mesh is there or on, which is also a problem we have with CNI. I can't tell if CNI is encrypted. I can't tell if CNI is enforcing network policies. My Helm chart can't tell that when I install. So maybe I install a bunch of network policies and it means bupkis. Maybe there's already an encrypted CNI there, and so I'm doing TLS over an encrypted CNI, and yes, I've got two layers of encryption, and they don't cancel each other out or anything, but I'm spending more CPU than I would need to. And we have no ways today to really detect and understand that in a standardized way. And if Kubernetes is really going to be the orchestrator for all of these things, I think it's kind of, you know, I think Kubernetes should define some standards for figuring these things out. Um, and that probably means that in four years, we will have written some caps and we will have implemented some caps and they will have passed the beta stage and be on by default and they will have rolled out to your cloud providers and you will have upgraded to those versions. It's a long road. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if we don't go down it because we see it's a long road, it's not going to get shorter. Um, it's not like people are going to wake up tomorrow and be like, hey, I think we should make Kubernetes release more often and with features that are less thought through and stable. Um, 
That, that pressure is never, is never going to win at this point. So um, the best we can do is start today and look at how can we do better. And yeah, as I said, like it's not clear to me, like Istio Ambient Mesh and a CNI are starting to look closer and closer together. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Maybe in five years, we can look back and we can find out what it meant. <laughs> I also am a big believer that everyone here is trying their hardest. And we're all doing the thing that looks best from our own position. So um, this is really not a, oh, X is bad or Y is bad, other than to point out that, like, why have we not figured out how to do custom CAs in 20 years? But, you know, tomorrow could be better. Good. Uh, if I can rephrase it a little bit, the question was, have I considered joining one of the steering committees and attempting to work on this? I kind of figured this out three months, or, or started figuring this out three months ago. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with the knowledge that I have, but one of the things I did was I put together a talk presentation and submitted it to the conference. <laughs> um, but yes, I am starting to think about this, and I'm not even sure what the right steering committee is. <laughs> Um, on one hand, it feels like if I want to fix the CA search stuff, I need to go, you know, figure out the, the folks in the Java community and the folks in the OpenSSL community and so forth and, and push them. And on the other hand, if I want to fix stuff like the CNI stuff, then, you know, that's probably a different, different set of people. But, yeah. Yeah, I want this stuff to be better, and so I'm, I'm willing to put some effort in. Well, now I have made up my missed time at the beginning. Y'all should have yelled at me, too. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing over there? And I'm like, oh, I thought I started at 210. It occurred to me that everyone was staring at me, but in a funny way. Okay. <laughs>